Guys, this, uh, this last week has been uh, one of the most encouraging weeks that I've experienced as a pastor of this church. Uh, throughout the number of years, we've had weeks of prayer where we've had powerful moves of God and, uh, you know, the church comes expecting great things. But this week was particularly special for me uh, just in how it kind of kicked off last week. Uh, last Sunday morning, I was planning to preach a message that I'm going to preach today, and we never actually got to the message. And so if you were, I apologize if you were looking for a podcast or looking for the sermon last week, if you couldn't be here in person, but we had a very special, intimate moment with the Lord uh, where we shared communion together, and uh, it, it, was, it was really special for me as a pastor um, and then to step away from that moment into a week dedicated to prayer and seeking his face where we came together every night uh, just simply to pray, to pray for one another, to pray for this community. And there was a beautiful simplicity about it, friends, that I can't say thank you enough for those of you that were able to be here for a few of those nights. Many of you guys were here for every single one of those nights. And if you weren't able to make it, don't worry. We do have frequent prayer meetings here that you can be a part of. Um, but I just sensed, and I shared this on Friday night, that I, I felt like the Lord was pleased with what was happening. You know, we didn't have a, there, there wasn't anything ultra attractive to get people to show up and get people to be engaged. It wasn't like we were bribing you with food or, or any kind of event. It was simple. The simple agenda was to gather together to seek the Lord. And uh, I believe the Lord was pleased with that. Uh, and his presence and his sweet spirit was uh, felt genuinely by all of us here. And I, as a pastor, I couldn't have been more encouraged and more happy with the ministry that was taking place this last week. And so I say that because I, I sensed a great, a great deal of community being developed within this congregation in the place of prayer. And uh, I want to continue on in our teaching from Acts chapter 2, where I started a number of weeks ago talking about the Holy Spirit and what a biblical community ought to look like. Amen? And so um, I'm saying this, I can't thank God for this community of believers enough. I know that, uh, I know that there are things that we could do that would be attractive and make this ministry uh, maybe... Uh, grow in numbers and we could we could do things that in terms of advertising and and me not being so awkward and having better people do announcements and offering and all and all that stuff to be a more polished experience but I believe what God's doing within Open Door Church within this family is cultivating a family that he can trust and I'm so thankful for that and uh, I believe uh uh, I want you to know this because the things I'm about to preach this morning, I'm not preaching as a rebuke to this church, as somehow we need to return to a, a, a biblical Christianity because we've got things wrong. I'm preaching these things from a genuine place of encouragement, of, of things that I feel as I've sought the Holy Spirit that we're getting right, that are serving and building as a foundation for what God wants to do in this community. And so uh, I just feel like it's necessary because sometimes... You know, there are rebukes that come from the pulpit. Sometimes there are things that need to be addressed. And I, I feel like the, the preschool teacher with like a gold star right now, that it's just like, I am, I'm, I'm pleased with what's taking place. There's always room for improvement, right? We understand that. There's always room for growth. I, I constantly want to be more like Jesus, but I sense the Father's heart in this, as we talk about this, as we kind of jump into the text this morning, that uh, what we have is good. Where we're starting is great. And I'm just so encouraged for that. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, um, a number of weeks ago, I outlined four areas that I believe the early church prioritized that served as building a firm foundation for kind of the globalization of the gospel, if we will. Uh, we saw in the book of Acts, at the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit moving, the church being established. And it says in Acts 2.42 that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayer. 
And we, we, we saw that and we looked at that and we talked about that um, this last, uh, I think it was probably like three weeks ago now, where uh, we saw these kind of building blocks of the early church really lay out a, fo- a foundation for the gospel to explode across the known world. And the rest of the book of Acts and the New Testament kind of outline the spread of the gospel. But we see this kind of as the initiation point. This was at the very beginning. This was where it started. And they weren't a perfect church. If you read the book of Acts, they had messes that they had to kind of figure out. And they had struggles. And, uh, you know, they were people as well. But this kind of foundation was enabling them to sustain hard times, tough times, but ultimately see Jesus glorified. And so uh, I love that we look at the apostles' doctrine, the teaching of the word of God, right? That's what we, we saw as kind of a primary pillar there, something that was extremely important. They listened to the words of the apostles, and the apostles' doctrine for us today, we see that in the New Testament, right? We see that in teaching about Jesus and the word of God. Uh, the fellowship of the saints. We talked about the gathering together of God's people, that koinonia, that fellowship of that sharing of uh, life together. It was sharing of, um, it was having common interest, common bond, condom, uh, common, <laughs> uh, common life together in that word koinonia. We talked about the breaking of bread, sharing of meals together, and primarily the Lord's, Sup- uh, the Lord's Supper. And remembering, uh, remembering his death, right, uh, and highlighting that. And that was very early church. That was, you know, right after Jesus had died and resurrected. They still felt it like it was important to make that a primary aspect of their gathering, of their services. And they gave themselves uh, wholly to prayer. I love all of that because I believe those areas have to be, uh, have to be fundamental to the church, and a lot of people kind of skip over one or two of them and highlight one or another. But we see the necessity for those working together um, in order for church health to be, to be a real thing. And I feel like that what God has been doing, whether it be through uh, teaching on Sunday morning or even with a deeper project as we get into the Word of God, with a fellowship that takes place, I'm, I'm excited that you know, people in our church like to hang out outside of church, that the only time we see each other isn't just on a Sunday morning. I'm encouraged by that. The sharing of meals together and as we, uh, as we take communion together as a fellowship, which we'll do at the end of this service and remembering the sacrifice of Jesus. I'm encouraged by that as prayer takes place here on Sunday mornings, on Wednesday nights, uh, throughout the week. Uh, I'm encouraged that all of these elements are are evident in our church. And I'm, I'm happy to say that. I'm, I'm encouraged to say that. But I love how the kind of the contingency on all of this, there was, a, there was like a prefix here. It says they continued steadfastly in these things. So it was a mark of consistent application, right? It was this mark of um, consistency in adhering to these things. The beauty wasn't in that they did uh, like one mighty signs and wonder. They didn't have some kind of sign and wonder or some kind of mighty miracle sporadically. But it was this consistent application of these basic things that really provoked the church to a place of spiritual maturity. And I am uh, I'm just encouraged by that. Um, And I'm encouraged by what we see here in our church, but also the room for growth in these areas as well. And so with that being said, uh, we had those four areas that were kind of outlined as the healthy foundation of a church. But moving from there, if we continue reading in Acts 2, 42, I'm going to read 42 through 46, um, I think there's some great spiritual fruit uh, that is that is developed as a result of the steadfast approach of these four areas of the word of God, of fellowship, of the breaking of bread, and of prayer that we see kind of manifest. I I labeled these the characteristics of a spirit-baptized church because that's where we've been. We've been talking about the role of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 in the life of the church and seeing 
uh, these five things, these five areas that the church excelled in uh, kind of come forth. And so I want to read the passage of Scripture, beginning in verse 42. It says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. They sold their possessions and goods, goods and divided them among all as any one had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Um, and I believe a church with a solid, steadfast foundation, like what we talk about in Acts 2.42, a foundation on the word of God, a foundation on the place of fellowship, a foundation uh, on the place of the breaking of bread and the remembrance of Jesus' sacrifice. And in a church that continues in the foundation of prayer is a church that he can entrust with adding souls to. And if there's something that I so desire for this congregation, if there's something I so desire for Open Door Church, is I want this to be a place where God can entrust adding people to his church. I want, I want people, I don't want there to be a question or a doubt in God's mind. If somebody gives their life to the Lord, then they wind up here at Open Door Church. Are they going to actually grow? Are they going to actually encounter a Christian fellowship that's going to provoke them to spiritual maturity? And I, as a pastor, so desire that what transpires and that what takes place here would uh, be behooving of the Lord to add to this congregation that, uh, that uh, men and women might be spiritually mature. Amen? Okay, so... Taking this passage of scripture, and I took it to the Lord in prayer, there were five, uh, five characteristics of the early church that I believe stemmed from this place of having a solid foundation. The first of which is the fear of the Lord. We see in verse 43 that the fear of the Lord came upon every soul. And we go on, the second, the second uh, characteristic that I noticed was that there were signs and wonders being performed in the early church. The third one was that we see a supernatural unity that is linking together the believers here. Um, they said that they were together and had all things in common. And that resulted, or that didn't result, that, uh, that resulted in them being moved with compassion. And we see uh, the fourth thing is radical generosity spring forth in the life of the early church. Um, where they were literally selling everything that they had to meet the needs. And this isn't like, don't worry, I'm not going to like just tell you, like sell everything you have, come and, uh, you know, give it to the church, or, you know, we're going to like establish some form of communism or something here. This was, this was like a willing act of the Spirit that provoked them to radical generosity. And I think coinciding with that, we see uh, Scripture tell us that they... Uh, they had gladness and a simplicity of heart. And uh, I believe that speaks of godly contentment. Even though they had sold everything, even though they didn't have anything to their name, they're forsaking jobs, they're forsaking family, uh, there was a simplicity of heart. There was a godly contentment that, uh, that really marked the early church. And I look at these five things, and I see very little of this in the modern picture of the Western church. And what I've kind of encountered in evangelicalism, I see a great deficit of these kind of five characteristics. I'm not saying they're completely absent. I'm not saying they're completely void. I'm not saying uh, even in this church that, they're, that they're, they're present or not. I believe that they are present here, but I believe we need to grow in these areas. Uh, I know for me personally in my life, I need the Holy Spirit to challenge and provoke me to grow in all five of these areas. And so, while that's kind of a brief overview, um, I want to jump into this first topic today in talking about the fear of the Lord. And I believe that this is cultivated, this happens as a result of the Holy Spirit at work in the life of the believer and in the life of the local church. That happens when we are steadfastly committed to spiritual growth. 
right? Okay, you guys tracking with me? I, I, hope I, I hope I laid that out. But verse 43 tells us that fear came upon every soul. And at first reading, at first glance, if you're not familiar maybe with the language of the Bible, that's okay. You read this and it can be confusing, right? It's all these positive things that are happening, right? Uh, uh, they're, they're living in Christian unity. They're, they're experiencing the moving of the Spirit. God's doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And it says that fear came upon every soul. And then that many signs and wonders were being done, that they, were, they had gladness and simplicity of heart. Everything mentioned in verse 42 through 47 is in a positive nature. But most of the time when we read about fear, uh, we have a negative connotation with it, right? Like we think of maybe, maybe you're afraid of spiders and you have arachnophobia. Maybe you don't like tight spaces and uh, you have claustrophobia or something like that. Or maybe you're afraid of speaking in front of people. All these different things we think of fear typically as a negative thing that withholds and restrains you and keeps you back, right? Um, and so uh, we look at this and the context is overwhelmingly positive. Uh, we have to... We have to come to the understanding here that the fear that existed here was uh, positive as well, especially as you read throughout the rest of the book of Acts, we see something uh, entitled the fear of the Lord that existed and that propelled and served as a primary facet of the momentum of the gospel going forth with the early church. And I want to talk about the fear of the Lord a little bit. Um, and I believe the fear of the Lord is 100% necessary for the success of uh, Christian living. If you want to be a Christian, you have to know what it is to fear God. Um, and I want to talk about that today because it's a little, it's, it can be confusing, right? We look at, we read passages of scripture and we, we think, well, doesn't 1 Peter 4 tells a, like, doesn't that tell us like perfect love drives out all fear? So how are we supposed to fear God and not be in sin? Right? Isn't there commands all throughout Scripture that tell us fear not or do not be afraid? Every time an angel shows up, it says do not be afraid, fear not. Everybody's like trembling in fear, cowering. Uh, so what is it to fear God and why is it important for us? Uh, Romans 3.18, he quotes the psalmist here, Paul does, and uh, he highlights the chief sin of all mankind. When, uh, when he's outlining that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, uh, he quotes the Psalms, uh, but 318 says this, that there is no fear of God before their eyes, and, and highlights that as the kind of the chief sin encompassing everything else that people have done wrong. It says that they have no fear of God at all, is how the New Living Translation would put it. And it's this serious problem within the heart of mankind that there is no fear of God. And so I realize this is confusing. Are we supposed to be afraid of God? Or are we not? If we read in Exodus chapter 20, verse 18, it says this. This is after uh, Moses has gone up on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. And there's like lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, which we're going to read about here. It's a pretty crazy uh, thing that we're reading in Scripture. In verse 18, it says, When the people heard the thunder and the loud blast of the ram's horn, and when they saw the flashes of lightning and the smoke billowing from the mountain, they stood at a distance, trembling with fear. This just wasn't reverence. This, just, this wasn't just like respect of God. They were genuinely afraid. Like you would be afraid of like a grizzly bear chasing you down right? Uh, most, most of you in here, if you had to like square up with a grizzly bear, would be afraid. And if you're not afraid, you're stupid. So uh, <laughs> that's okay. Fear isn't necessarily a 100% bad thing in there. I'm terrified of animals that can rip me apart. Um, it's okay. Uh, they were actually afraid. They were trembling with fear. And then Moses says to him, uh, and, they, and they said to Moses in verse 19, you speak to us and we will listen, but don't let God speak directly to us or we will die. In verse 20, Moses says, don't be afraid, Moses answered them, for God has come in this way to test you and so that your fear of him will keep you from sinning. So if I could break this passage down very simply, give you great exegesis, is that this is a command to not be afraid of God and be very afraid of God. You guys got it? We can pack up, we can go home. 
don't be afraid of God, but be afraid of God. Am I giving mixed signals this morning? Is there some dichotomy here that we've got to work through? Uh, because when I read this, Moses' command is, don't be afraid. <laughs> God has come to you in this powerful demonstration of his majesty, of really showing his nature here and how holy and how awesome he is uh, so that you would fear him and that it would keep you from sin. What? <laughs> so we have to understand that there is a fear in Scripture that is a positive fear. It's a reverential respect for God, and uh, we're going to talk about the fear of the Lord. And here we see the fear of the Lord is something that keeps us from sin. It keeps us from the place of displeasing God. And when I talk about the fear of the Lord, um, there is an aspect of looking at his power, looking at his majesty, looking at his awe, looking at his might, and seeing that that was... Uh, that. That judgment that can come from, the holy, from a holy God was meant for me. Looking on that in power, looking on that in awe, and recognizing that uh, he put it on his son instead should stir my heart to wonder, should stir my heart to reverence. But the fear of the Lord is a good thing, and I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. Uh, it's directly connected to our relationship with him. Um, and I, I, like to, I like to quote, I think it's John Bevere that uh, said this first, but he talks about the fear of the Lord being the key to unlocking intimacy with God. And I believe that that is so true, and I believe that that is why the early church experienced the moving of the Holy Spirit that they did and saw the growth that they did and saw God do the things that he did was because they walked in close fellowship with him. And I believe that the fear of the Lord is the key to walking in close fellowship with God. If we read Psalm 25, 14, it says, Friendship with the Lord is reserved for those who fear him. With them, he shares the secrets of his covenant. How many of you guys have, uh, how many of you guys have uh, heard that language? Uh, I think there's a song out there that's popular, Jesus, Friend of Sinners, right? That, that, that is a... That is a not an actual title of Jesus. I want you guys to know this. Jesus, friend of sinners, was not like a name of God. That was actually something that was perpetuated by the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the day as an insult to Jesus when he was hanging out with tax collectors, when he was hanging out with sinners. And it wasn't that God didn't care for them. It wasn't that God didn't love them. It wasn't that he was uh, uh, unafraid to be associated with them. The reality is friendship has to be a two-way street. I can't just be a friend with Adam without his friendship being reciprocated to me. Otherwise, there's no relationship there. Does that make sense? And so the same thing is true with our relationship with God. You cannot be a sinner and be a friend of God. That's not something that is uh, possible within the character of God. Uh, you can't be a friend of this world and be a friend of God, how James would put it. Uh, and so I say this uh, cautiously because I want us to understand that God, God regards his friendship. He regards relationship with him as something to be revered, as something holy, not something that is casual that he just flippantly gives away to anyone without question. There is commitment that is required. There is something called the fear of the Lord. He says, friendship with me is reserved for those who fear me. That is something that is, that is, something that is uh, I, I don't believe, commonly referenced to in our society. I don't think that's something that, is, uh, that a lot of people are signing up on the bandwagon to agree with. Everybody wants to say, God is your friend. God is your friend. But the reality is, if we've not been made right under, uh, under what Jesus did on Calvary, if we're not actually spending time with him, if we've not embraced Jesus as Savior, God is not our friend. It actually says that we should, uh, we should have a fearful expectation of judgment of God, that we should actually be terrified of this king, be terrified of this one that can cast our body and destroy our soul in hell. That's what Jesus talks about. He says, fear that guy. Be afraid of that guy. And I realized, whoa, that's crazy, Nate. Like, that's not, 
happy peaches and cream and really wraps things up in a nice bow and makes me feel all cuddly and fuzzy inside. But the reality is, if we want to be friends with the Lord, if we want to have close relationship and intimacy with him, we have to understand that he takes that seriously. It doesn't come with a casual commitment. Okay, so I'm saying this. You cannot claim to be a friend of God without the fear of the Lord. Scripture says that. He says that. And so when I say Jesus, friend of sinners, and we look at that, that was never a title that Jesus claimed for himself. That was meant as an insult to him. And so I say that he reaches out to sinners. He's, he, he's willing to be everyone's friend, but friendship does not come forth until it's mutually reciprocated and there's actual relationship. And he's made every provision. He's made every desire. He's done everything uh, possible to have relationship with mankind. Does that make sense? Okay. Before you leave here and you're just like, God, Pastor Nate just said God hates sinners and he, uh, and he doesn't want anything to do with the lost or anything like that. Don't, don't go there. That's not what I said. Uh, <laughs> Leviticus 10.3 uh, is this interesting verse of scripture. It's this interesting passage that comes after Nadab and Abihu who were uh, priests at the time, uh, they come in and burn strange incense before the Lord. I think strong argument could be made in reading Leviticus that they, that they were actually intoxicated coming into the presence of the Lord and uh, kind of just came in casually to minister before him. They drop down dead. Like, they die. <laughs> um, and the Lord says this in Leviticus 10.3, By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. I read a passage of scripture like this, and I see how serious God takes uh, his nearness and how seriously he takes his closeness with man, which we know he desires because he's made a way for us to be close with him. He's made a way for us to be, uh, be together with him. He's saying, if you're going to come near me, you have to regard me as holy. You have, to, you have to recognize me as different. You have to recognize me as someone that is deserving and worthy of praise. He's not just our cuddly friend that we just kind of treat, uh, you know, with contempt. Uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to use a good example here, and I didn't write it down. So you can see me grasping at uh, straws. Uh, Jesus is very much our best friend, but he, we can't just treat our relationship with him as though he's just any other person. He can't, have, uh, he can't have this idea of him just kind of being added to our week and being added to our lives. Uh, he deserves having our life rearranged, revolving around him. Um, I think too many of us just treat God as another thing to add to our lives. We just treat Jesus as another thing that we sign up for. And there's actually no reverence. There's no commitment. There's no consistency in actually serving him. And we wonder why we can't hear from God. We wonder why he feels far away. We wonder why it's awkward to be in his presence. And I think, uh, I think we'd be quick to realize that there isn't, um, there isn't the respect. There isn't the response of reverence. There isn't wonder that exists when we spend time with him uh, because we don't really know him. And we haven't really spent time there. I defined uh, the fear of God as this, and I wrote it down. Just simply, it's not just being afraid of God. It's not just being afraid of what he can do to us or anything like that. It's this fear. Uh, the fear of God is an attitude of respect, a response of reverence and wonder. And it's the only appropriate response for our creator and our redeemer. If we go into the Greek and we look at the word used for fear when we're talking about the fear of God in the New Testament, it, uh, it, it actually translates reverential fear. It's not a mere fear of his power and righteous retribution, but a wholesome dread of displeasing him. And so I like to think about the fear of God as this. It's not so much a fear of God sending me to hell. It's not so much a fear of, of you know, his, him zapping me with a lightning bolt or something like that. I have a holy fear of displeasing my father. 
I want there to be a motivation in my life that I would tread cautiously with my actions, with my conduct, with my speech, with the way that I lead, because I don't want to displease my father. Not as a place of, not out of a place that he might, might punish me, but out of a place of, I want to be pleasing to him because I love him and I've seen his mercy in my life. Does that make sense? I believe that that's where we see this change, this, this, this fear of just fearing God because he's powerful and he could kill us and he could send us to hell and those things, which he's completely holy and he's powerful. But I believe there's a transition that takes place where uh, when we walk in the fear of the Lord in an appropriate reverential fear of God, it's one that we don't want to displease him. We want to cautiously tread in his presence because we want to be pleasing to God. And this is where I read in Acts chapter 9, 931, it says, this is my church growth strategy. Um, and uh, I want to present it to you uh, this morning. <laughs> In Acts 9.31, it says, The churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. If you read the verse before this, Paul is just, uh, he was about to be murdered and killed. And the very next verse is, The churches uh, all have had peace and were edified. Um, and so even in the midst of conflicts, even in the midst of adversity, Scripture defines them as having peace because they were walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. And if I, if I could give any kind of uh, exhortation this morning, is that uh, in order for us to have the appropriate fear of the Lord, it has to be married with the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And I think that this is where a complete picture comes together because it's not so much just being afraid of God and his mighty hand, but I believe the Holy Spirit comes as encouragement and as comforter in the midst of seeing God's awesome power that enables and empowers us to respond to walk in holiness and to walk in a manner that is pleasing with God. And so the way that I wrote this down is that the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit operate in tandem to produce spiritual growth. It's not just us cowering in fear. It's not just us kind of uh, living in this place of fearful expectation of God's judgment, but it comes through when marriage with the power of the Holy Spirit, the comfort of the Holy Spirit here, that we see that we see God work to bring about spiritual maturity. We see the church grow. Um, and I think a lot of the times we see these things as at odds with one another. You know, we shouldn't be comfortable when we think about the fear of the Lord. It should make us uneasy. It should really expose our sin. It should really, uh, really make us question, uh, question things. We want to be examined by God and and then we have the Holy Spirit over here as the comforter, as the one that lets us know that everything is okay, that everything's going to be all right. And we have to have a marriage of those two uh, working together in seeing uh, fruit produce and seeing the church grow uh, because we, it's easy to get kind of out of line. I don't know if that makes sense. And so my prayer for us this morning my prayer for us going forth is that we would be a church that is marked by the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. That we would approach God with reverence and awe, that our actions would be pleasing to him, that we would have this holy fear of displeasing him, of grieving the Holy Spirit, that we would walk in such a manner that's worthy of him in combination with the comfort of the Holy Spirit that would come and encourage and empower and equip and reassure when things aren't easy. And we see in the midst of complete chaos and turmoil that the church had just experienced martyrdom. Saul had just given his life to the Lord. Now he's going by Paul because that's his Greek name and all that stuff. And they're trying to kill him. And it's in this place God says that the church had peace because they walked in the fear of the Lord and the Holy Spirit. And I... Guys, we could talk about this all day and we could really outline it. I've got more scriptures and stuff, but my prayer is that we would just 
simply submit ourselves to the working of the Holy Spirit, that we would hold God in the first and highest place in our life, that there would be a holy reverential fear, that there would be an honor for him, and that his Holy Spirit would come and make himself known as comforter because uh, we need him and we need that.